Good morning, this is Dan Richardson and I'd like to welcome you to the Chapel of the North Hills today. This is August the 2nd and this is our online edition of our worship experience. Today at, our, at the chapel we're considering the most important thing, the one thing that is actually needed. And it's kind of appropriate that we look at this passage today because we're going to celebrate together a, a fellowship dinner and there'll be a, uh, several people throughout the room eating together and this is a story of a dinner party in Luke the 10th chapter the end of the chapter Martha is hosting a dinner party and you know when Jesus comes to dinner he doesn't travel alone and so there's at least 16 people to feed and so there's a lot of work to be done and here's our story let me read the passage to you Luke the 10th chapter starting in verse 38 while they were traveling he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. So, Jesus answers this question, what is the most important thing? We see what Mary is doing, we see what Martha is doing, and then we have to make our choice. So there's another thing that is never going to be taken away from us, and that's the, the power of the blood of Jesus to affect our salvation. So let me share with you one of the songs we're going to be singing in worship today. The blood that Jesus shed for me Way back on Calvary The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Oh, it reaches to the highest mountain, and it flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day. Well, today we continue looking at the topic of one job. God tells us, you had one job, and we don't want to mess that one job up. We've got to figure out what that one job is. And it can be really daunting to look at a chore chart and see all the things that have to be done. And sometimes we might tend to think, well, if everybody's just staying home, there's a whole lot less to do. Well, I have not found that to be the case in my life. I have found out that, that uh, not only is there more to do, but because of uh, electronic communication, it's like I'm always on duty. I don't know, that's a, that seems to be a thing. You know, somebody can send you an email in the middle of the night and expect you to respond to it. Well, I'm, you know, this is, uh, this is off the clock. And so sometimes we, we get to thinking about that, that there's just too much to do. There's, there's a, a lot of tasks to be working at. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture today that challenges us to narrow it down to one. If there's one thing that has to be done, what would that one thing be? And we find this story in the 10th chapter of Luke where... Jesus is being invited to dinner. And if, uh, if you didn't know, we're inviting you to dinner today. Right after church, we're having a worship uh, fellowship lunch right next door. And it will be about the same size party. 
So keep that in mind here. Jesus enters a village. Let me just read the passage of Scripture with you. Luke, the 10th chapter, verse 38. Uh, now it happened, they went as they went, he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So the first thing we notice is Jesus is being invited to dinner. And Jesus didn't have his own house, and he depended upon the hospitality of other people as he did his travels and as he did his, his ministry. And he was always uh, welcomed into people's houses that would, uh, that would give that uh, hospitality to him. Now we can, we can put some pieces together from other stories about Jesus and know where he was. This was the city of Bethlehem, of Beth, Bethany, sorry, Bethany. Bethany is a suburb of Jerusalem and it's just on the east of Jerusalem, out toward Jericho, not very far away from the main town. It's kind of like out here from downtown. That's about how far away it is. So it's just, uh, it's just right on the outskirts there. And this was a place that Jesus really enjoyed visiting because of this family. They had Martha and Mary was a sister. And we know from another story that there had a brother who lived there with him his name was Lazarus, okay? So that's the family that, we're, that they're, we're talking about right here. And Martha invites Jesus to dinner. Now, when Jesus comes to dinner, you've got a house full, right? Because he didn't travel by himself, okay? So let's figure it out. There's Jesus and then there's 12 disciples and then Mary, Martha, Lazarus, so we're talking at least 16 mouths to feed, okay? Got to keep that in mind. At least 16 people are here to dinner. And so that kind of sets our stage here for what's going on in the, in the story. Martha welcomed him to the home. There's Mary, and she was sitting at Jesus' feet, and she heard his word. So keep this in mind. What was Martha doing? She was sitting at Jesus' feet. Now, do we ever encounter Martha, uh, Mary in other places? Yeah, we do. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind here as the story progresses. Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sisters left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Or another version says, tell her to give me a hand. Okay? And then Jesus responds to each of these two ladies. So Mary, let's remember, what was she doing? Listening. She was sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to Jesus. Well, at Jesus' feet, do you know what that indicates? That is the posture of a disciple. In those days, the teacher would stand or sit and the students would sit at the teacher's feet. Okay, so she is acting like a disciple. Now that's not so strange. Today we think about girls in school all the time, but they didn't have girls in school. Girls didn't go to school. Girls didn't learn the law. Wives would learn what they knew about God from their husbands, but Boys went to synagogue school and girls didn't. Boys would become disciples of rabbis and girls wouldn't. So this is a situation where there's a barrier that Jesus is ignoring, breaking it down. Jesus did not object to her sitting at his feet and learning. You know what that means? That means that everybody can sit at Jesus' feet and learn everybody now whenever you're reading the Bible when you read a story always remember that story is put in that place for a reason Luke put this story in this place for a very good reason look what happened right above it just glance straight up above and see what happened there what's that story 
That's the parable of the Good Samaritan, isn't it? Okay? And the Good Samaritan is a story which indicates all racial barriers are broken down. Okay? This was a different ethnic group. These were the half-breeds. These were the ones that everybody was prejudiced against. And so, Jesus said, no, Samaritan is the good guy. Wow. So he broke down that barrier. Right here he's breaking down a barrier of sexism. That boys and girls can both learn about Jesus. Okay? We may have different jobs in the, in the church. We may have different skill sets. Uh, men and women, but God is, has a place at his feet for everybody. Okay? Now, this is, this is also something that I think it may have become sort of a habit for Mary. Because later we look at the story where they comes to Bethany again after Lazarus dies. And Martha comes out and greets Jesus. Mary comes out and greets Jesus. But when Mary comes out to greet Jesus, she falls at his feet, doesn't she? Here, he, here she is again. She's at Jesus' feet. That's John the 11th chapter. John the 12th chapter. Where do you see Martha, uh, Mary there? She's the one that busts in while they're all eating, and she anoints Jesus' feet. So the pictures that we have of Mary, she is at Jesus' feet over and over again. So here she is at Jesus' feet and she's listening to Jesus and she's learning uh, from Jesus. She recognized that this is a really unique opportunity. Jesus doesn't come over to dinner every day. That's an opportunity, however, that we have all the time. According to Hebrews, we have access now to the throne of grace by the blood of the Lamb. We can go straight in anytime and listen to Jesus. So this is, this is the opportunity we don't want to miss either. Well, let's look at Mar Martha. What was going on with Martha? She was there and she was serving and she was distracted with much serving and she approached Jesus. Now, the Bible says that she was distracted. Okay, let's camp right there for a second. Martha was distracted. She was not able to commune with Jesus. She wasn't able to sit and enjoy Jesus' presence because she was distracted. Now, I'm cutting her a lot of slack because Martha had a lot to do. Remember, 16 people come to dinner. And she was serving everybody. So I really want to applaud Martha. Martha gets things done. Martha is the one that uh, they, would, they would have some growling stomachs if, uh, if somebody didn't get in that kitchen and get to work. Okay? So let's not be too hard on her. Because the first thing we said, that said about her is that she's distracted. Now when it comes to being distracted... I bet we can all raise our hands and say, yeah, that happens to me. You go down for a prayer with Jesus. You want to spend time with Jesus uh, intently. And you want, to, you want to read the Bible. You want to pray about stuff. And then what happens? Oh, what was that? Oh, there's the phone. Bloop, there's the noise on my phone. I wonder who said that. And there's a bird flying by. There's all kinds of things because... Satan would love to get your mind off of Jesus and off of God's Word. He would just love that because as soon as you quit thinking about God's Word and listening to God, then he's got you. He can make you think about all kinds of things. See, he can make you think about all the work you've got coming up. Does anybody uh, sit there and think about all the things they've got to do tomorrow or today or, or the meetings that you're going to have to have or all the the little trips that you've got to take, you think about those things and you roll them over in your mind. Oh yeah, we all do that. So Martha was being distracted. Well, Satan is good at distracting us and he's been doing it all the way from the beginning. Okay, 
trying to get our mind off of God's word. Something that Carlos and I talk about often is how he came to Eve and said, did God ever say that? Did God really say that to you? Kind of twi- pushing her away from what God really said. Well, Martha was distracted and she was serving. Okay. The gift of service is very, very important. The gift of hospitality is a spiritual gift and God has given it to some people and we applaud them for that. We love them for that. But she was distracting and not only was it serving, it was much serving. Many tasks, your Bible might say. And sometimes those service tasks are thankless tasks, aren't they? Okay? Sometimes the people that end up doing all the service for other people, it just doesn't ever seem like that's appreciated. Like it's, it's not going anywhere. Like nobody even notices and nobody even cares. All right? And so uh, that's, the, that's the sentiment that you can imagine Martha having. You know, that's what your mom may have felt. You mother, is that what, that's what you might feel as a homemaker. I heard it described it as homemaking is like trying to put pearls onto a string before you tie a knot at the other end. And then you just put something on, and the faster you put them on, the faster they come off the other end. Well, so she was distracting and distracted, and she had much serving to do. It's a noble task. You notice that Jesus doesn't com- condemn her for serving? He didn't say, Martha, you're serving too much. He didn't say that at all. He's talking about priorities. He's not saying that service doesn't need to be done. But the distraction and the many tasks did get her off track. Okay? Once she talks, we start realizing that it's gotten off track. Okay? Maybe the, maybe the lack of... of thanks that has been coming her way or the lack of help that she's received gets her off track because look what she says first. Lord, don't you care? She accused Jesus of not caring. Hey, you can get distracted. You can get overwhelmed with uh, many tasks. You can get overcome with grief as we often do. But do not, do not doubt that Jesus cares for you. Never let it go that far. If you, if you do, just think about the cross. That settles it all. The blood that Jesus shed for me will never lose its power. And that settles it. We are to cast our cares upon him because he cares for you. Martha's not the only one that ever did this, right? And we can, we can uh, imagine the disciples going, she said Jesus didn't care. Oh, But then what about those disciples? You remember them in the boat? When storm came up and Jesus was having a nap, they shook him waking up. Jesus, don't you care? Said, all right, hold it right there, fellas. Jesus cares. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. He absolutely cares. He cares more than we can ever know. So, don't let it go that far. She accused Jesus of not caring and she's left me to serve alone. Oh, my sister's left me to serve alone. Now, why didn't she talk to Mary? Why doesn't she, why didn't she, Mary, we got a lot of work here. She didn't talk to Mary. She goes straight to Jesus. Okay. Um, now this is something I, I've always, always noticed. People that are doing hard work, one of the things that they notice the most is the people who aren't, <laughs> right? Yeah. You're, you're digging a ditch and you're digging your ditch and you're sweating, your back is aching and you look over and you're just counting all the people that are leaning on their shovels, right? That's exactly what's going on. You take note of who's not doing any work, aren't you? And, oh, Mary, she's not doing anything. You always feel like you're alone. Whenever you're working, and sometimes, especially when you're working for the kingdom, when you're doing something for Jesus, 
you might feel that you're the only one there. You're doing it all alone. Well, that's not true. Elijah thought he was the only one. Elijah complained to God. God, I'm the only one in the whole country that still loves you. And God had to tell him, no, 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 no. no. You're not even one in ten, one in a hundred, one in a thousand. We got 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. You are not alone. God would love to tell all of us that. You are not alone. If you're like Mary and you're listening to Jesus, He'll tell you that. You think you're all alone? You think you're the only one doing God's work? He'll remind you, no, you're not alone. There's a lot of people that are doing God's work. Okay. So, she goes a little further. She even starts to boss Jesus. <laughs> right? You can just imagine her, can't you? When she's got a dish rag and, her, and she's got a, her hand on her hip and she's starting to spout some orders. Jesus, tell her to come help. Tell her to give me a hand. So don't go that far. Do not tell Jesus what to do, okay? Jesus doesn't need you to give the instructions, okay? Jesus doesn't need you to be the captain of the ship. You remember there's the body metaphor where all get to be part of the body. The job of head is already taken, okay? Jesus is the head. He's the one that does the, the instructions. We get to all be part, so we get to take the instructions. We don't get to give the instructions. So I, that's kind of funny right there. She starts trying to boss Jesus. Yeah, but how about that? Telling Jesus what to do? You know how that works out most in my life? I end up saying, all right, Jesus, here's my plans. Now bless me. <laughs> how about that? This is what I'm going to do. Now send your blessing upon it. You know, I, I should flip that around, shouldn't I? I should say, God, what do you want me to do? What would, what would you bless? What work would you want to, to bless? I'll do that. That's the way it ought to be, right? We ought to get the instructions. Then we know God's going to bless it. God is absolutely not obligated to what I want to do. But he is totally obligated to what he is going to do. What his will is, is going to, to happen, he's going to make that happen. Okay? So make sure, make sure we don't try to give God any orders to tell Jesus what's going on. Well, let's, let's see what Jesus says in response here. He tells her a couple of things. Martha, you're worried. He doesn't address all the work that has to be done. He doesn't address uh, how, how much is going, whatever's going on in your life. He looks straight at her and he says, I know you're worried. Worry is a problem, okay? Worry is a big problem. You realize that God, when, when Jesus, when he was doing the Sermon on the Mount, he started knocking off some big sins, lying murder, lust, materialism, and right in between money and materialism, he stuck worry. He said, don't serve two masters. Then he said his bit about worry. Don't be worried about anything. And then he talked about judging one another, which is dealing with other people. Most of our worries come in between money and other people, right? That seems to be the sandwich there. Your anxieties, your worries are sandwiched in between financial and people problems, right? That's almost all of the stuff we worry about. And that's a problem. Mar Martha, you're worried and you're troubled. You're troubled. So he meets her where she is he knows what's going on in her heart. Martha, you're worried and you're troubled. When you go to pray to Jesus, you don't really have to tell him any information. Okay? 
You can cut straight to the chase because he can read your heart. He knows what's going on in your heart. And he might tell you the same thing he told Martha here. I know you're worried. I know you're troubled. I know what's going on in your life. Cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. She was troubled and she was upset. And Jesus said, one thing is needed. Here it is. One thing is needed. If you've only got room on your task list for one item, here it is right here. It's what Mary's doing. Now, what was Mary doing? Let's remember. Listening to Jesus. Sitting at his feet. Enjoying his presence. If you have nothing else to do today, enjoy God's presence. Be in the presence of God. There is no more important thing to do this day or any day. Be in the presence of God. As a matter of fact, he didn't say that one thing is really cool. Or one thing is, is more important than all the others. What he said is one thing is necessary, right? He didn't say it was good, didn't say it was better, didn't say it was best. He said it was necessary. We have to do that. We have to be in God's presence. We have to say, God, I'm giving you this time and I want to hear from you. I want you to speak to me. How is it that God speaks to us? All right, let's, let's kind of review some, some of the ways that God does his talking to us. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's, that is the presence of God that is with us now, is the Holy Spirit. When you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit, and he's going to orchestrate the events in our life according to his plan according to his direction, so that we can come out where we need to be, okay? Uh, there was a movie uh, that kind of tangentially related to Christ. It wasn't exactly a Christian movie, but there's a lot of Christian themes in it. Great movie called Ben-Hur, very famous show. Charlton Heston had to learn how to drive a chariot for that movie. He had to really learn how to work that thing and it wasn't easy. And he was struggling with all the controls and the reins of the horses and stuff like that while he's balancing on the chariot. And he just finally went up to the producer and said, you know, I just can't do it. He told the director, William Wyler, I'm not gonna be able to win. I can't get the hang of this. The director told him, all you have to do is stay on that chariot. I'll make sure you win. That's the director's job, to make sure he wins, right? Listen to the Holy Spirit. All you gotta do is stay in there and he's gonna make sure you win. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. God speaks to us through prayer also, right? When we're praying, you know, we cut God off, don't we? We say, good morning, Jesus, hello, our Father which art in heaven, and then we usually go straight to, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. And just before we would, might be able to give God some time to listen to him, we say, in Jesus' name, amen, we get up and we're gone. Well, we need to put all of our needs a little bit later, okay? And actually, you know, God knows what we need. We need to spend that time in prayer listening to God, listening to him speak to us. But... Prayer is certainly powerful. And God speaks to us through prayer. And God answers our prayer. I was just reading about a missionary named John Patton. One of the old missionaries from the 1800s. And he was a missionary in one of these, these countries that uh, now it's called Vanuatu. It's in the South Sea, uh, uh, the South Sea Islands near Fiji and all that. Um, whole group of islands and he was a missionary out there and there was cannibals on that island. The first missionaries, they didn't even last an hour. They got cooked and eaten within the hour that they landed. 
And he and his wife were on that, on that, uh, island, those islands to minister, to minister, to start the, uh, spreading the gospel. And they had a little complex there for the mission. And they were really scared one night that, uh, they had heard that all of the, the locals were going to surround the complex and kill them. Well, they just got on their knees and they prayed. He and his wife prayed all night long, praying for protection all night long. And in the morning, all they saw was the natives leaving. They thought, wow. And they just praised God, but they didn't know what had happened. Well, about a year later, the chief got saved. And then they became friends. And he was asking the guy, why didn't you attack us that night? Why, why did the, what happened there? And the chief said, well, how could we attack you? You had all those giant armed guards with those shiny swords. There's no way we could have attacked. God speaks through prayer and he was answering those folks prayer. Well, as I was reading through that story, it was called the New Hebrides or Hebrides back then. It's the nation of Vanuatu now. 82% of that country is Christian. 82%. That's one of the most Christian nations in the entire world. That's an amazing story. God speaks to the Holy Spirit. God speaks through prayer. And God speaks through His Word. Whenever we're opening your Bible, find some information. Trace people out on the maps. I like doing that. Try to, uh, try to imagine the chronology in your head. You can do all of those great things. Try to trace the characters. But never forget that when you're reading the Bible, you're listening to the voice of God. As God spoke to the authors that wrote, God still speaks to us as we read. This is the voice of God that we that we open up, that we listen to. Okay. God speaks through the Spirit. God speaks through the church. God speaks through other people in the church. Okay. Sometimes something that somebody says at church, you recognize, oh, God told him to say that. I really needed that comment that that guy said. Or perhaps even that, that hug that the, that the person gave me at church. God speaks in all these different ways. And he said, one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the right choice. Right? He didn't say, she made a pretty good choice. She chose what was better. He said, she chose what was right. She made the right choice. Did you realize that? Listening to God is a choice. Sitting at Jesus' feet is an opportunity. Mary saw the opportunity, but it is also a choice that we make. And it is the right choice. It's something that we need to decide we're going to do. And it's not going to be taken away. Isn't that great? Jesus has the door open and you can go in and visit with him and listen to him and he's never going to say oh not right now you know i got a lot of stuff going on i've got this thing and and i've got over here people praying and so sun's coming up over here markets are opening he's never going to say wait whenever you want you get to go visit with him and listen to him it's always the right time and it's not going to be taken away if you're too busy for God, you're just flat out too busy. Make time for God. Let's pray together. Everybody say hello. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, it's hard to serve lasagna perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Say hello. Hello. Hey, Andy. Missing you. Hello. Hey, check it out. All right, this is Bear and Ivan, Ivanya, yeah. <laughs> Iranya, and they're helping to build our wall 
So kind of like the Nehemiah project where they built the walls. Uh, these guys are uh, are building walls here, fixing up our our uh, side. You can see the, the previous wall there, uh, right along the top edge. All the way around. All the top edge right along there. And now they're going to continue it down this way. Mark out our mark out some bushes and uh, start to get the start to get this front of the building looking better and better. So awesome. We praise God for you guys and for your service. Thank you, Lord.